lateral approaches to the elbow. Discussed anatomy pertinent to this approach. We've got all the muscles on the lateral aspect of the forearm, starting with anconius, ECU, EDC, ERCB under the cover of ECRL, and then ECRL and brachioradialis. Biceps, we really just need to think about the distal insertion of biceps in terms of pronation and supination. In full supination, it's in the anterior aspect of the forearm. In full pronation, it goes between the ulna and you'll find it just there posteriorly. And that has implications, particularly if you do a void interval approach to uh, the proximal radius. The nerves, we know the radial nerve branches into the superficial radial nerve and the postentosseous nerve. And the postentosseous nerve starts anteriorly and then gradually crosses the midline and hence slightly posteriorly. And as such, the more anterior, are, the more the nerve is at risk, the more posterior are, the safer you are in when it comes to the postentosseous nerve. This article from 2000 elegantly showed us how in full supination, if you then pronate the forearm, it takes the radial nerve more anterior and more distal, moving it in the midline from roughly three centimeters to five centimeters. And it makes it more parallel and more anterior. Flexion and extension of the elbow had no effect on the position of the postentosseous nerve. The most important thing, however, to take from this paper is that although that's the average, the minimum distance in this paper was 38 millimeters and echoed in this paper from 2007 that it moves at four centimeters. And so four centimeters in the midline really is your safe cutoff for the postentosseous nerve. The nerve to anconius is the branch from the radial nerve. The lateral branch of the radial nerve to the lateral part of triceps continues laterally and enters anconius, as you see there in this picture, just uh, in the middle of anconius where that white arrow is. There are no real vessels to worry about on the lateral approaches to the elbow. Uh, the ligaments we worry about are the lateral collateral ligament is complex, particularly the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. We've got the lateral ligament complex proper with the annular ligament and then the lateral collateral ligament coming from lateral epicondyle and inserting into the supinator crest. As for the bones, we've got the ulna, the radius, um, and we can sometimes see the tip of the coronoid from the lateral approaches. In terms of positioning, I like to put them supine with their arm across their chest on a DHS leg support. And if I know I'm going to need to see more of the lateral side, what I'll do is translate the arm further down their chest so I see more of the lateral side. If I need to see the middle side, then I'll bring them up. If I need to see both or I have to sort of hedge my bets, I'll keep them dead center in the middle line. Most people, I suspect, if you're just doing a pure lateral approach to the elbow, would put them supine on an arm board. And in fact, when Kaplan described his approach back in 1941, he put the patient prone. I think it's a bit overkill to put someone prone to get to the anterior lateral aspect of the radius. Interoperative imaging, for me, I bring the image intensifier parallel with the bed and simply bring the arm out of the trough parallel, uh, lay it down onto the image intensifier. And the skin incision really depends on where you're trying to get to. Most times for me, it's that universal posterior skin incision. If you're just using Cocker's interval, you center it over Cocker. If you want to do a more anterior approach, lateral epicondyle, centered where you think your interval would be. And your lateral intervals start with Boyd between the ulna and Anconius, then Cocker between Anconius and ECU, Kaplan between ERCB and uh, EDC, and then the EDC split. And it is what it is. It splits EDC in the middle. One of the problems with the more anti approaches like Kaplan is the postentosseous nerve. The problem with Cocha is really that lateral ulnar collateral ligament. And if you, you can use a Cocha window and then move the muscles anteriorly and still split your lateral collateral ligament as complex and your annular ligament anterior to the insertion of the lateral collateral ligament, lateral ulnar collateral ligament, but you just need to be aware of it. I like the Boyd interval, and the Boyd interval is between ulna and anconius. And so you split the anconius fascia, peel back anco anconius off the ulna, and then simply incise the capsule and the annular ligament as it inserts onto the supinator crest. And this is where it's important now to bear in mind the position of your arm. Although pronation will make your postentosseous nerve safer, if you pronate the forearm, it delivers the biceps tendon to this point just over here. And so then you can cut the biceps tendon. So if I'm doing the Boyd interval, I will fully supinate the arm. Because with Boyd, you never have to worry about the pin. You never need to worry about the postentosseous nerve. 
and I can then cut down on my supinator crest, releasing uh, supinator, releasing the annular ligament, coming all the way distally, and I'll never encounter the pin. It's one of the nice things about the Boyd interval. And once I've peeled it all off and re released it, you can repair it with transosseous drill holes. This is what it looks like, humerus on your uh, left, uh, ulna on the right. I've uh, incised the Anconius fascia and I've left a cuff of about two or three millimeters to allow me to repair the Anconius fascia. I've peeled off the Anconius with just a periosteal elevator and now I slip my knife along the capsule, proximally going to distally and release the annular ligament off the supinator crest. And this is really what you see on Boyd. You see the lateral wall of the ulna. So it's a really beautiful approach for these proximal ulnar fracture dislocations. It allows you to see that supinator crest fragment, which is often a, a piece that's broken off on that lateral wall. It shows you all of the radial head and the radial neck, and you can get all the way along the radial neck for one of those radial head fractures or neck fractures that extends distally because you can just keep going. You're never going to encounter the pin on the boy. It gives you a beautiful view of the capitellum, and you can get a nice view of the lateral facet of the ulnar humeral joint. You can see perfectly where your radial head will align with the lateral facet of the coronoid when you're doing a radial head replacement if you can't fix it. And as you can see here, you can still repair your lateral collateral ligaments. You can get to the insertion point. If you've got ligamentous instability, you could put an anchor into the lateral epicondyle, take your sutures across outside the capsule to your supinator crest, take them out through transosseous drill holes on the subcutaneous border of the ulna, and you can correct yourself an internal brace. And so for me, Boyd, allows me everything for radial head replacements, capitella fixation, uh, articular fractures, the distal humerus is described by ring, um, these complex proximal ulnar fracture dislocations. And in the terrible triad, I get a beautiful view of the radial head and its relationship to the coronoid. And if I need to get to that bit of capsule, that little bit of coronoid, it's normally broken off the lateral side, off the anterior lateral side, that's an intermediate ridge of the coronoid, I can get to that through the defect. As for the repair, you can uh, do transosseous drill holes. Here I've taken a drill from the subcutaneous border of the ulna, exiting along the, the line of where the capsule inserts, along where the annular ligament would attach. And you can weave a modified Kessler suture into the remnant of the annular ligament. And you see that as a nice smooth surface uh, just there uh, next to the radial head. You can then retrograde shuttle your sutures through the transosseous drill holes and tie them over the good cortical bone and that gives you a really strong repair, sort of repair that you can ride a horse on. After that, you can repair the anconius fascia, um, uh, 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 closing uh, beautifully. Wrightington described using Boyd's interval to get to the radial head, and they did it in the context of radial head replacement. And if you have arthritis or uh, an elderly patient, you'll find that the supinator crest because of its osteophytes or the enthesophyte, really the bone growing into the annular ligament, becomes a significant impediment to you being able to sublux the radial head, to get the radial head away from the ulna so that you can instrument it. And so Wrightington described a supinator crest osteotomy and they repaired it with anchors. I think you get a much stronger repair with transosseous drill holes. Um, I still sometimes do the supinator crest osteotomy if I'm doing it for an elective uh, uh, procedure and for arthritis. But I wouldn't do it for trauma because I'm worrying about radio ulnar synostosis. I'm worrying about uh, cross union. And so I generally just uh, peel the capsule and annular ligament off the supinator crest and then repair it with transosseous drill holes. And that just shows you what a normal supinator crest would look like. As to whether you pick Kocha or Kaplan, uh, the problem with Kaplan is your postentosseous nerve. And the problem with Kocha, if you're not careful, you might start behind the lateral ulnar collateral ligament and then release it. So you need to be aware of it. One of the problems with Kocha is it really doesn't give you a great view of much. It gives you the lateral part of the capitellum. So if you've got one of those capitella fractures that's extending into the trochlea, you can't really see that. If you've got a radial head fracture that's more anterior, you will struggle with that. If you need to see your relationship between your radial head and your lateral facet of the uh, coronoid to get the height of your radial head, you can't see See that and then you need to take an x-ray with the elbow in extension and so cocha really for capitellum or radial head fractures is not very good cocha is really good if you're looking to reconstruct the lateral collat ulnar collateral ligament because it runs perfectly in that area you can extend the cocha 
by taking it up the lateral supracondylar ridge. And if you start it behind lateral ulnar collateral ligament, it means releasing that ligament. It's not the end of the world. You can put an anchor into the center of the capitellum and repair it, but it uh, really doesn't give you much more benefit other than giving you that lateral ulnar collateral ligament window, window, often used when you're doing a reconstruction of the lateral ulnar collateral ligament. You can extend it distally between uh, ECU and the ulna, and that you can keep taking distally because you're not going to come across the pin. The pin starts anteriorly and stays in the extensor mechanism. It doesn't cross it across the ulna and the bone. Kaplan approach, Kaplan described it with prone with the little finger pointing up because that pronates the forearm and makes the pin safer. So for the pin, pronation is safer. But if you're doing Boyd, pronation makes it dangerous because you might cut the biceps tendon. But this is a more anterolateral approach. You're not going to come across the biceps tendon here. You made an incision three centimeters above the epicondyle and then continued that five centimeters distal to the radiohumeral joint. I might suggest that you restrict that to four centimeters because that's the minimum safe distance. He then followed it down to bone between EDC and ERCB and continued it up the lateral supracondylar ridge. You can identify the pin, you can identify supinator. Um, and that's the sort of view that you would get with a Kaplan. This article looked at the differences between the Kocher and the EDC split. And essentially the EDC split is a Kaplan, but just a little bit lower. And so I'd put the EDC split and Kaplan in one sort of group. And personally, I wouldn't do a Kaplan. I'd always say I'm doing an EDC split because I never have to then find that ERCB EDC interval. If you just do the EDC split and the Kocher, that's what you see. You see radial head and you see a little bit of capitellum. It's really when you extend your uh, approach up that lateral supracondylar ridge that the real value of this anterolateral approach comes. EDC split or Kaplan are uh, relatively similar. And this, this is what you can see. You can see capitellum beautifully. You can see that lateral facet of the ulnar humeral joint for those articular fractures that are starting to go across medially. You can see your radial head. You can fix your radial head. You can replace your radial head. You can see that your radial head is just at the right spot in terms of your coronoid. You can see coronoid through the EDC split or Kaplan, but you can't get much of a trajectory down on it to do much to it. And one of the prices you pay is that you strip the capsule off the humerus for this beautiful view. And so you may fix down that little bit of ulna, you may fix down that capsule, but you've then released the capsule off the humerus. And the elbow has got very little proprioception, okay? It needs all the help it can get. So everything comes at a price, but that's what you would see with an EDC split or a Kaplan extended up the lateral supracondylar ridge. So in summary, those are the muscles on the lateral aspect of the forearm. With pronation, it takes the pin more anterior and distal, but it takes you to a minimum distance of four centimeters. You have the four intervals on the lateral side, Boyd between Anconius and Ulna, Kocha between Anconius and ECU, Kaplan between ERCB and EDC and the EDC split. I like Boyd because it avoids the nerve and I can deal very nicely with the annular ligament and I can repair or reconstruct or internal brace my lateral ulnar collateral ligament through that approach. If you need to get to the radial head for a more elective procedure and there's a large osteophyte on your supinator crest, don't forget the Wrightington approach where you osteotomize the supinator crest. Personally, I prefer transosseous drill holes than anchors. I think you get a sound of repair. As for Kocha or Kaplan, I reserve Kocha only if I need to get to my lateral non collateral ligament, if I'm doing a lateral ligament reconstruction. I'd be more inclined to use a Kaplan. In fact, I would call it an EDC split because then I don't need to find the interval between ERCB and EDC. Thank you.